want you all to close your eyes. Think about the steep seating as you enter the auditorium, the large stage at the front of the room, and the bright red TEDx USC sign behind me. Now go ahead and open your eyes. Imagine this is your new reality. What you see right now is what over 41 million people experiencing severe visual impairment around the world see when they open their eyes, near or absolute darkness. The summer before college, I had the opportunity to visit the Blind People's Association in Gujarat, India. I remember walking through pitch black darkness in a blindness simulation called Vision in the Dark. For nearly half an hour, I was led by the hand and voice of a man experiencing blindness into a dark room. But before even the first minute had passed, it's safe to say I was scared out of my mind, as most of you probably are now. For the first time, I tried opening my eyes, but I still couldn't see. He stopped me, held my hand, and asked, what does it feel like to be blind? In the simplest of terms, a loss of vision puts the world into perspective. My name is Manushree Basai. I am a 22-year-old Indian-American woman with long black hair. I'm wearing a black button-down shirt with gray slacks and standing at the front of the auditorium on a bright red carpet. I'm here to share with you how a man experiencing blindness in fact gave me vision and what I did with my newfound sight. Now, when I visited the Blind People's Association, I was both in shock and in awe. Walking through tall, ironclad gates, I entered what seemed like a rather close-knit community. The plot of land had a primary school on the right and a workplace on the left where adults with disabilities worked as physical therapists, yoga instructors, and even managers. Despite how physically closed off the community seemed, the persons with disabilities at the BPA thrived off of an unfathomable energy of solidarity. In India, the way that many people perceived ability in 2018 reflected the recency of the rights movement. Disability was still perceived to be inconvenient to a person and their family, while ability was commonly construed to be the opposite and thus desirable. This resulted in the lack of a disability-inclusive society in India and hence the BPA's physical isolation. However, the empathy and the social consciousness of the community inside gave me hope that this sentiment would one day permeate those tall ironclad gates. A shift to a disability inclusive society, while difficult to achieve, was not impossible. Sash, one of the kids experiencing blindness, ran up to me, took my hand, and led me into a classroom where he and his classmates were reading from braille books. He eagerly said, Didi, Didi, meaning sister, sister. Let me read you a story about Disneyland. He sat down on the bench, opened his braille book, and began reading to me. He was so eager and content to learn. He didn't think of his lack of vision as a barrier. Rather, it was his superpower. The BPA created a space where disability identity could be cultivated, a safe space where people could gather and find community. It was at this moment that I realized I had always been looking, but for the first time, I saw. I saw with empathy and compassion and care. I saw these kids holding each other's hands, playing tag, and singing religious hymns. Their normalcy with what we distinguish as a disability was refreshing, and it was a perspective I was determined to introduce to everyone I met. Disability rights should be everyone's concern. Later that day, Mr. Bhushan Punani, executive director of the BPA, greeted me with excitement and began to inform me about the organization. We talked for hours, and when I mentioned my intersectional passion for medicine and policy, his eyes lit up. He informed me of an ongoing Indian Supreme Court case in which the Medical Council of India was denying a 17-year-old petitioner, Praswani Asasosh, access to medical education simply based on his visual impairment. Mr. Punani requested me to help collect any documented evidence I could find before the final Supreme Court hearing in just 48 hours. In what seemed like a race against time to help build a stronger case for Praswani Asisosh, I felt charged by the research and resources at my disposal. I immediately saw an opportunity to foster change, and after visiting the BPA, my empathy gave me a reason to do so. Outraged by the injustice, I, alongside with my colleague, who at the time was in America, 
set aside the 12 and a half hour time difference to write a policy brief urging the Supreme Court of India to end discrimination against students in, with visual impairment in higher education. We developed a policy report outlining successful international precedents of students with low vision who had gained access to medical education and actually thrived in clinical settings as well-respected physicians. Our research was followed by pleading with the Supreme Court of India to simply listen to these lived experiences and give students both the choice and the control over what they needed to access the life that they wanted to live. It was only two months later that I received perhaps the greatest sense of selfless satisfaction. I sat knee deep in my American roots, halfway around the world from where I started, staring in absolute disbelief at Mr. Punani's email. It read, you will be pleased to know that Mr. Atukosh Praswani has been granted admission today. This is the first time that a person with visual impairment has been granted such admission. We were later notified that our case had been read in court by a well-known public interest lawyer for the Supreme Court of India, Honorable Prasant Bhushan, and helped secure the greatest change for minors with visual impairment in Indian legislative history. <laughs> Just a few weeks later, I started college as a freshman at USC. I was eager to capitalize on the positive momentum of the change that I had just experienced and the new perspective that I had gained. Recognizing that Praswani Asukosha's case was far from uncommon, I began to internalize the mantra that being disabled should not mean being disqualified from having access to any part of life. So now, when I was walking to and from class, I began to pick up on inaccessible and inequitable spaces in my immediate environment. For example, the most popular coffee shop on campus, Dulce, has a ramp, but it's hidden to the side of the building, leading to an unautomated door. Or our social sciences building, a popular classroom and meeting space on campus, has no signage for wheelchair accessibility and only two ramps leading down to the entrance of the building. This really got me thinking. As a student, how can I create a demand for inclusion? Right as I was getting acquainted with campus, Mr. Punani from the BPA introduced me to Mr. Pranav Desai, founder of Voice of Specially Abled People, a global advocacy organization for rights of persons with disabilities based in Los Angeles, California. One of MOSAP's flagship initiatives at the time was a public utility mobile app that allowed users to crowdsource data on the accessibility of buildings. The intention of this feature was to create a database of both building images and accessibility ratings so that persons with disabilities could search using the same app to find accessible spaces in their day-to-day -day lives. Leading nearly 60 Trojans across campus, my colleague and I compiled ratings for over 90 buildings and public entrances and started mapping out all of USC for its physical accessibility. It was at this point that I really started to see the potential to create a more inclusive campus culture. My hope was that for students with disabilities, as they acquire or explore their disability identity, to feel as though they were deeply connected to a rich and diverse movement, to know that they had a culture and that they had rights. Driven by the desire to make these rights everyone's concern, I was humbled by the opportunity to be invited at the 12th session of the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2019. At the United Nations headquarters in New York, my colleague and I spoke as the youngest speakers at the conference amongst 178 state parties. There, we urged both leaders and volunteers alike to recognize that disability could not be achieved without equity also being part of that equation. We stressed that working in a coalition, whether that be through building a global accessibility database or creating solidarity in the cultural conversation, would be instrumental in advancing the rights movement. I returned to USC with a fervor to continue my work for disability activism. I began to notice that while more visible social identities such as race, ethnicity, and gender were often prioritized and represented in higher education, mixed and non-visible social identities such as disability were still not foregrounded. However, I saw power in shared frames and wanted to create a space where we could collectively leverage parallels across these justice movements. This resulted in the start of the VOSAP Collegiate Network, which brought together both students with disabilities and allies to create a demand for inclusion. However, soon after my colleague and I started the network, we were met with a shift to a remote working environment with the onset of COVID-19. 
we were presented with the challenge of still having to mobilize these students to create that demand for inclusion while not physically on campus. In response, we created a robust research curriculum and led for two summers a disability research internship that supported student-led scalable projects related to disability justice. Working with over 50 undergrad and graduate students across 20 projects, we created a disability internship that supported topics ranging from employment to technology to healthcare. It was at this moment that I really started to see that shared sense of solidarity Many of the students, like myself, were allies of the disability justice movement, yet were equally as passionate about making disability rights everyone's concern. For my work with BOSAP, I was invited to speak at the UN Commission on Social Development for Affordable Housing and Social Protection Systems for Persons with Disabilities, and most recently at the UN Commission on the Status of Women for the Inclusion of Women with Disabilities in Climate Change and Disaster Risk Reduction Dialogue. Much like many of these internship projects, which spanned from understanding disability in everything from employment to technology to healthcare, speaking on these platforms reminded me that there is a disability angle to almost any progressive issue that affects our own day-to-day -day lives. Thus the nuance of the collegiate internship, the network, and speaking on these platforms was this budding hope inside me that every student, ally, leader, and stakeholder would walk away wanting to foreground disability in their respective future endeavors. Disability rights are civil rights, are basic human rights. Many of us have either experienced living with a disability, will at some point in our lives, or know someone who has. We must show care and compassion and do the right thing when barriers are identified. We must support those derailed by barriers. It takes courage to listen to identify challenges, and to work with affected individuals to take the necessary steps to make things right. But that's the responsibility of each and every one of us. Accessibility starts with me. Am I doing enough? Am I willing and committed to doing better? And it can be done in the simplest of ways, whether that's offering a visual description of yourself before speaking in front of an audience, not flattening someone's identity to their disability, or even foregrounding disability in your own lives and careers to proactively build those more inclusive and accessible spaces. I've learned that the disability justice movement is exemplary of a progress that isn't just political, but deeply personal to millions of people, and I hope now to you as well. By creating a shared sense of common identity and power in the disability justice movement, I am confident that we can normalize inviting disability into conversations about equity. As I look to all of you today, I am reminded that I never needed my dream of a more inclusive world to be easy. I just needed it to be possible. Now I want you all to close your eyes for one more moment. This time, when you open them, understand the privilege of being able to take a good look at the world that you're 